This is the Transmissions from Atlantis Entertainment Network. Expand your wonder. Transmissions from Atlantis Entertainment presents The Vampires of Whitechapel Episode 1 The Letter Part 1 Written by J.C. Delatore Note This show contains dramatic scenes of horror and descriptions of violence or gore that may be unsettling to young listeners. Parental discretion is strongly Death isn't something to be feared, my dearest. It is the warmest, most welcoming sensation anyone can experience. It's pure joy, passion, and ecstasy rolled into one. As you travel down that tunnel toward the light at the end, you feel the most amazing sensation of belonging. You are finally where you should be. A place with no pain, no horror. There's no suffering or injustice. There's just a dazzling light that seems to engulf every single atom of your essence. Enjoy your death, my friend. Bathe in the light when it comes to you. Be thankful it can come for not all of us can go down that path. I've died. I began my trek, but the light was robbed from me. Substituted with darkness, terrible darkness that invests you like the worst of cancers. You see, I was marked by a vampire to become his offspring, his child of the night. He brought me death, but then, breathed in an entirely different, terrifying life. Everything that I was and believed in, all that made Ariana Grayson, died with me when my heart stopped, and I began my journey to the place of death. It's gone now. I know and accept it. All that is left within is a soulless monster that feeds on humans. I never wanted this, unlike so many others. I sought to root out the killer, and I became what he was. He raped my soul, robbed me of my decency, my humanity, my ability to die, to love, to have children, real human children. The monster that I am has become glorified in movies and literature. Thousands of teenage girls would give anything to feel his kiss, but they don't know the truth. The Edwards, Stephens, Lestats, and Vampire Bills of the world don't really exist. They're a sexual deviant's fantasy. Our kind, from what I gathered so far, doesn't fall in love with humans. We get infatuated, certainly. But not for sex. It's more about the blood. Every single drop of it. To feel the vampire's kiss, you have to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. When it's laid upon you, it's not a simple peck on the neck. There's nothing sensual about it. It's a brutal, vicious attack that will leave your body torn to shreds. Our blood rage consumes us, changes our physical features to better serve our diabolical purposes. Normally, I'm a thin redhead with a decent figure. 
My hair is about shoulder length, eyes emerald green, and my skin definitely shows the need for a decent tan. I may be ginger, but my body doesn't show any freckles or moles. In fact, there isn't a flaw anywhere, if I can be that conceited. It's one of the few benefits of the affliction. When the rage takes me, though, any perceived beauty disappears. I completely transform. My nails morph into long, dagger-like claws. My mouth expands, and a set of long, jagged teeth come to the surface. My red hair disappears, receding somewhere into my epidermis, as my ears elongate and my true form reveals itself. My eyes are no longer green, but black, like looking into the darkness itself. If you come across me in this form, it will be the last thing you will ever see. When the rage takes you, there's no controlling it. There's no stopping it. All we can do is surrender to the lust, satisfy it, and clean up the mess left behind. It's all done in the shadows, mind you, to avoid discovery. Although some, like my maker Alistair, flaunt our power over you. I don't want to hurt anyone. I hate that I am responsible for so much pain and death. I have no choice. The affliction will consume your every thought, and all that matters is tasting the blood, chewing the internal organs and sucking them dry like a demonic milkshake. I tried for a while to channel my hunger, to focus it on the murderers I was charged to capture. It worked well for a time. But then one of my partners came across me at the wrong time and... Well, I'll get to that. Just know, it's a terrible existence, my friend. So, how did Ariana Grayson, special agent in the FBI, become a monster? I was on a case. One of those career-making cases, tracking the most active serial killer in the United States. We were close to a breakthrough, but I'll get to that part too. I want to tell you first about the letter. For to understand what I became, you have to understand who he is. Alistair the Annihilator. The serial killer who is much more than that. I found the letter in my home, on my bed, and it read something like this. My dearest, first, I'll tell you what I am not. I am not a vampire that glitters in the sun. I don't fall in love with human beings. Nor have I any ties to my mortal coil. I left that long ago. I don't care for vampire rights. I'm not seeking a synthetic alternative to human blood. Despite long life, I have not been ignorant to all around me. I've learned things, amazing skills, that have served me well. I can't turn into a bat or wolf. I can't fly. I do not have the power to control the mind. Although, I can be extremely persuasive. When I hunt, I don't speak to my food. Trick them into a comfort zone. Or seduce them. It would be tantamount to you seducing a cheeseburger. I don't fight or destroy other vampires, nor do I prey on just the evildoers. I have no aversion to sunlight or crosses, although in the sun, my power drains. I cannot be killed by a stake through the heart. I am not a psychic vampire. I don't walk around trying to steal aura or what have you. I am not a pretender. One who drinks blood because it provides me some sort of sexual arousal. What I am is a predator, and I am hunting you. 
as you can imagine, dear listener. That part concerned me greatly. I had been hunting this fiend for quite some time. I knew what he could do. I typically don't do this. Communicate. But you are a rare breed of human. You show characteristics that could make you a high-quality addition to our kind. You don't seek it. Like many who have romanticized the visions of Nosferatu in the movies or literature. The quality I see in you is your desire to prey on others. Not evil like me, mind you. You see the weak-minded. Those who are failures in the epic battle for survival. You pounce on their vulnerability and take what you desire. It has gotten you to where you are today. For that, I say bravo. Still, you could be so much more. Let me continue by telling you about us. As you would expect, many mortals know about us, thanks to the invention of film. Still, they don't know the real us until it's too late. There aren't many of us left, you know. How we were created remains a mystery to us all, much as it is for you. Are we God's creatures? Satan's warriors? I know not these things. I do know the first was named Upir Glikhi. Living in the 900s, he created an army of us across Europe and Asia, creating a panic among the human population. During the 1100s, our kind became hunted. The human beings became so concerned about our existence, they would turn against their own, burning perfectly edible morsels at the stake for superstitious signs that were neither accurate nor true of the accused, we retreated into the hills of Romania and fed on animals that resided there. Our disease, DNA, whatever you call it, infected some of these, mainly wolves, creating a different beast. I am sure you know of lichens. Yes, they exist as well, as bastard monstrosities that Dr. Moreau would be proud of. But I digress as they don't matter. As our numbers dwindle, the oldest sought to create new offspring. That is how I came to be. Like many of our kind, I am not completely vampire. I am a half-blood. To be pure vampire puts you among royalty in our society. Yes, there is a vampire king and queen, and they do procreate in a very human fashion. All of us know of them and are connected to them psychically. We cannot refuse their commands. The year was 1888. I was working for George Lusk and the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee in London. Our goal was to capture the fiend who was known most as Jack the Ripper. With the police bumbling and baffled, we patrolled the streets, looking for any suspicious characters. Ah, oh, Mr. Connisher. Come out of your ivory tower to help the common folk. Must we do this every time, Lusk? Uh, I'm sorry, sir. I suppose as commoners should be thankful to a fine dandy as yourself coming down here and overseeing our enterprise to find the man bloody in our streets. I'm here to offer my assistance. Nothing more. Who said we needed it? Probably the same question the police addressed to you. The police? <laughs> Fools. 
I wouldn't know how to find Jack if they caught him knife in hand. Are you certain of that? Hmm. I wonder how you could be that certain. Unless... You... Oi! Enough of that! That kind of talk will get a mare right killed! Quite right. My apologies. So, Lusk, where do you want me? Now, why don't you head over to Miller Court? We're scattered in all different parts of the city. If Jack strikes tonight, we'll be ready. And if I find the fiend, what am I to do? <laughs> well, I suppose you can cry out for mercy. Pretty boy like you, you're not that far off his menu. Mr. Lusk! I had no idea you had a persuasion for- Shut your mouth! That's worse than the other accusation. Just blow your damned whistle. We'll all come running. <laughs> Very well, Mr. Lusk. Good hunting to you. It was there near Miller Court where I spotted a strange looking fellow wearing a dark long coat. He had a small felt hat that covered his eyes, but he was moving quickly from the area. I'd seen him before nearby the other killings. As I followed, I noticed droplets of blood on the ground from where he had tread. I didn't blow the whistle. I didn't want to have the Vigilance Committee come down on someone who perhaps just cut his hand at the butcher shop or sustained some other injury. I had to be sure. I followed him down a dark alleyway and through what seemed like a maze. I lost him in the darkness. Unnerved, I turned to return from where I had came. I couldn't figure out in which direction I had come from. I was lost. He hit me with more power and force than I've ever felt in my lifetime. I was slammed against a brick wall, and the air expunged from my lungs as I slumped to the ground. I was dazed as I looked up to view him. It was there. I saw our blood rage form for the first time. His hands were tipped by long, dagger-like claws. His face was elongated with immense canines protracting from it. Blood from his previous kill still drizzling down his white chin. He had some facial hair. A small moustache that turned up at the corners and bushy eyebrows. He was, most distinctly, not human. You dare follow me? I turned my head from the horror in front of me, and a warm stream of urine began to saturate my trousers. No, you will not return from your destiny. I know you, Alistair Conacher. I know you have gotten close to me on several occasions, yet didn't realize it. You're... you're him. I am the one you call the Ripper. And now you've seen me for what I am. It is time for you to make a choice. What? What choice? Life or death. Choose death and you will end up like those whores I've been feasting on. I will dive into your midsection and pull out the most blood-drenched, tastiest morsels. Suck them dry and bathe in your blood until I have reached my fill. I... I choose life. Life, damn you. Spare me. Spare me, hideous beast. <laughs> <sighs> the sight of its large, knife-filled grin terrified me all the more. It was as if I was staring down the gullet of a great white shark. Teeth upon teeth. If you choose life, you will become like me. A murderer. A monster. You will be consumed by your bloodlust until you can no longer control it. Then you must feed. So now, it's time. Choose. Yes. Life. Life. So be it. Just remember, you chose this. The vampire grabbed me by the neck and pulled me close. I struggled, and he swung his claw-filled hand, striking me at the temple and knocking me woozy. As I began to lose consciousness, I could feel him force my mouth open and regurgitate into it. I woke in the alley the next day, alone, my face and shirt covered in blood. I felt strange, 
weaker than I ever felt in my life. I searched my body for injuries, but there were none. It was not my blood. I struggled out of the alley, concealing myself from any curious onlookers. I moved quickly, trying to avoid suspicion, and made it back to my flat. Mr. Lusk's aspersions aside, I was not a rich nobleman. I was, of course, a gentleman. I had a business, textiles, and I lived alone. Had a few friends, no family. I was very much a loner. Why did I venture out into the night to seek Jack the Ripper? Truly, my dearest, I know not. Perhaps civic duty. No, not that. Sympathy for the whores? No, I could care less. Fear that the fiend would turn his attention to much more valued citizens? He had shown no such inclination. No, dear Ariana, I think it may just have come to destiny. A macabre fascination with the most famous case in history, taking me down the path to what I would become. I didn't venture out for several days. I could feel my body changing, morphing into something completely different from what I once was. I found that if I kept my windows covered and the sun did not touch me, I would not feel as weak as I had been when light hit me. It would be night when the changes occurred. I was strong, powerful. My heart raced and I could feel my features changing. I would try to eat, but nothing satisfied my hunger. I tried to drink, but nothing quenched my thirst. I felt as if I were going insane. I could hear things, voices that were not there. I could hear others from the other side of the building speaking. On the fifth night, I remained in my home, lying in the middle of my living room floor, and I could sense someone walking in the hallway. A knock came at my door. I could smell perfume and sweat. Plus, something else. A musk that invoked a salty taste in my mouth and turned a ravenous hunger. I creaked open the door. Pardon the intrusion, Governor, but I was frightful worried about you. Hadn't seen you on patrol for a few. Molly Chambers. A whore I had befriended during my vigilance duties. Yes, I've taken ill. It was a voice that sounded nothing like mine. It was more like... Oh, you do look a frightful sight, sir. Can I make you something to eat? Curiously, my mind filled with her thoughts. She had fallen in love with me. Silly whore. I could never love her. But there was something else I wanted. Yes. I need to be fed. Come in, please. Thank you for listening to Vampires of Whitechapel. If you like our show, subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or any of the podcast apps that podcasts are aired. Be sure to rate our show. If you'd like to listen to commercial-free versions of this podcast and ensure the next season of Vampires of Whitechapel, join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash TFA Entertainment. We will have exclusive Vampires of Whitechapel content, including Patreon-only episodes, early access to these episodes, and behind-the-scenes interviews with actors and creators, all just for you. Join us next month as we bring you another spine-tingling chapter of our vampire coven. Alistair Conisher and Jack the Ripper were played by Alexander Dottie. Ariana Grayson was played by Cat Noel. George Lusk was played by Scott Ropel. Molly Chambers was played by Cat Noel. This episode was written, produced, and directed by J.C. De La Torre. Music for this episode was provided by Midnight Syndicate. Find more of their music at midnightsyndicate.com. You can find out the latest news and developments regarding this audio drama at vampiresofwhitechapel.transmissionsfromatlantis.com 
and our Facebook page. Be sure to follow the Vamps on Twitter at Ariana Grayson, at Alice to the Vamp, and at Jack the Ripper WC. But be warned, if you at them, they just may at you back. This has been a production of Transmissions from Atlantis Entertainment.